the basic question I'm asking today is how has the pandemic affected American democracy? There are many issues in American democracy that predated the onset of the COVID-19 crisis that I guess we could time to about March 2020 in the United States. So if I were giving this talk in February, for example, I would tell you that I work at a research center that typically examines problems with democratization outside the United States, but that we started a program on the United States in 2013 because it seemed as if there were problems with American democracy as well. And given that democratization can be a long and basically never ending process, we focus on a few of the ones that seem like they have potentially detrimental effects on democracy here. Um, and the main one is that Americans have been declining in their trust in government for the past few decades. They don't think that our elected officials necessarily act in, their, in, in the interest of all citizens. And this is driven by a few different patterns that we've found in our politics. So the talk today will go over what each of these are, political polarization, inequality, and the conduct and nature of our elections. And we'll also discuss how the COVID-19 crisis shapes all of these things. Political polarization, very briefly, just describes the divisions between the parties, not only the ideological distance, but also the sort of incivility and antipathy that has come to characterize some of our politics. Since Trump took office in 2016, there have also been new issues related to rule of law and corruption. These issues were pretty dormant in American politics for a long time, but have been sort of reinvigorated given how he has sort of governed. Um, the second one, which has been on many of our minds, has gotten a lot of attention during the pandemic, is inequality. And here I refer not only to economic inequality and the gap between the rich and the poor, but also issues related to racial justice and persistent racial gaps in how Americans experience their government and have opportunities in the United States. And the final issue has to do with elections. So the basic requirement of democracy is that you hold free, fair, and legitimate elections our elections are um, hamstrung by any number of somewhat antiquated uh, administrative issues and also some issues of concern to Americans like campaign finance, gerrymandering, et cetera, uh, which have received more political attention and public attention over the past few years. So I'll conclude by talking about how you hold an election in the middle of a pandemic. The general takeaway is that the COVID-19 crisis, despite the fact that crises can sometimes create opportunities for unification uh, or for leveling and balancing out uh, different groups in society, actually probably exacerbates all of these pre-existing issues in our democracy. I will try to end on an optimistic note about uh, what the reform community is doing and what activism is doing and how I believe that this could actually be a really nice opportunity for rebuilding our democracy. Just to give you a sense of where we are in terms of this crisis though. So the novel coronavirus emerged in China in 2019 um, and quickly spread to the rest of the world. Coronavirus has been in the United States since by some estimates, February, um, but really became more of a protracted crisis in March when the six counties of the Bay Area on March 16th were the first in the country to issue shelter in place orders to try to contain the spread of the virus. We now lead the world in the number of coronavirus cases. There are over 3.3 million confirmed cases, over 130,000 confirmed deaths. Um, and we have, according to experts, not really exited the first wave of the crisis. So we have cases still rising in 41 states and the District of Columbia. To the right is the, a picture here of President Trump and Anthony Fauci, who has been the doctor um, appointed to head the coronavirus response. Even though Donald Trump was photographed wearing a mask at Walter Reed Hospital over the weekend, there has been politicization of any number of aspects of the response to coronavirus, and it is somewhat epitomized by this photo with Dr. Fauci wearing a mask and Trump not. Here is just a heat map of where the cases are as of yesterday's New York Times case count. The cases first emerged on the west and east coasts in major cities. Um, and that also probably has something to do with shaping the early national response, but at this point has spread to basically every state. Now, since the coronavirus crisis hit and states issued uh, stay at home orders, we've also seen a wellspring of civic activity and protest. Um, on the left here is a photo of a Black Lives Matter protest in Washington, D.C., outside the Capitol on June 6th which was a day of national protest in which 15 to 25 million Americans participated in, in Black Lives Matter protests um, in response to the 
police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, which were the sort of final in a long count of murders like that. Um, and on the right are protests of a different sort. Three armed gunmen as part of a liberation movement storming the State House of Michigan in response to Gretchen Whitmer's stay at home orders. And also um, someone who has co-opted here some rhetoric from the pro-choice movement to proclaim her sort of opposition to mask wearing. So to go back to the issues raised at the, at the beginning of the talk, political polarization is probably the foremost characteristic of our politics today. This is a graph of polarization in Congress showing the distance, the ideological distance between the Republican and Democratic parties in both the House and the Senate. While polarization was very high after the Civil War, it went down steadily during the 20th century, but since the 1970s or so has been on the rise and has reached historically high levels recently. And it's not just the case that our elected officials are polarized. We as Americans are also polarized. So this is just some public opinion surveys from the Pew organization showing that your average Democrat and your average Republican have identified in ways that are more consistently liberal and conservative and more distanced from someone of the opposing party. Uh, people also indicate that they support their party more, there's more in-group favoritism, and they distrust the opposing party more. And what this graph doesn't really capture is that many Americans are turned off by all of this. So more and more Americans, up to 40%, identify as independents and say that they are cynical about both parties. So polarization has a corrosive effect, not just for people who are part of the parties, but also for people who are watching all of this and becoming increasingly cynical. Now, polarization has effects on government. It can make governing very challenging. Parties in Congress are less likely to compromise or negotiate. And it also then provides a pretext for leaders to politicize other non-elected aspects of government, for example, to try to do policymaking through the executive agencies or to rely heavily on the courts to settle policy disputes. Polarization also has effects uh, in society. What we now think of as affective polarization, which is sort of the um, academic term, you've probably seen in the media as hyperpartisanship or even tribalism, not a term that I particularly like. But this tendency we have to favor our in-group and dislike the out-group has become worse and worse over time um, to the point that it seems as if every, everything can get politicized. Um, parts of the consequences include motivated reasoning where your perception of facts and events is dependent on your political uh, preference. So for example, people tend to think the economy is doing better when their party is in power and tend to think the economy is doing poorly when their party is out of power, regardless of the objective economic conditions. Um, but we also live in a time of a fragmented media landscape where you can get information and news from many different sources. So increasingly, Americans are likely to choose information and news sources that tell them um, what they, that basically cohere to their pre-existing ideas. Uh, and there's also residential patterns. Cities tend to be very liberal and, and vote very democratic, whereas rural areas and suburban areas, this changed a little bit in the 2018 midterms, but rural and suburban areas tend to be much more conservative. And this is reflected not just in which parties you elect, but also any number of lifestyle choices and uh, choices you make about how you think, um, what you think the government ought to do, how much you support the state, et cetera. Um, and finally, there's even some evidence that polarization affects highly individual decisions that we make, including who we're friends with, who we choose to marry, who we hire for jobs. Um, there's evidence that partisanship has become a new dividing line in our society, and there are forms of bias or discrimination that people now employ using partisanship as a sort of heuristic. Um, and this also can produce what's called homophily or a lot of homogeneity in your social circle, which makes it even more unlikely that you're going to come across an opinion that differs from yours. Now, how has this changed in the age of Trump? Trump is a sort of unique figure here because he's very polarizing himself. He initially entered politics um, as part of the birther movement, saying that President Obama was not born in the United States. And his candidacy in 2016 was designed to sort of shake up the Republican Party and was initially designed as a criticism of many of the Republican candidates. He was elected in 2016 in a wave of global populism. Populism is a political style in which um, political leaders try to define us versus them and say that they are part of some rightful majority in a, in a country um, and the corrupt elite is holding that country hostage. 
Also, populists tend to say that only they can be the true expressions of the popular will of the people. But the ways that Trump has embodied populism are pretty direct and very similar to the way other populist leaders have ruled. He demonizes his opponents, whether they're in his own party, sometimes they work for him, sometimes it's the opposing party. He also likes to go after democratic institutions, both formal and informal, like the media or judges who rule against him. Um, and a criteria that he employs when making governing decisions is loyalty rather than merit or technocratic expertise. So some of the ways that um, polarization has been sort of sharpened in the crisis include any number of aspects of politicization of the response to the crisis. One of the first elements is the politicization of basic science. So unlike leaders in many other of our peer countries, like advanced industrial democracies, the US has not managed the crisis effectively. Um, the Trump administration has sidelined experts in science. Later on, I'll talk a little bit more directly about Trump and the CDC. Um, he has touted some unproven treatments and said the virus is likely to dissipate quickly. Um, hydrochloroquine is one of these treatments or drinking bleach famously was one that he also touted. There has been a politicization of the behavioral changes that might mitigate the spread of the virus, such as wearing masks. And finally, um, he has often pitted economic concerns against health concerns as if they're mutually exclusive when other countries' leaders have tried harder to try to strike a balance between the two. There has also been a bit of a politicization of the supplies that um, health workers need, essential workers, and also supply and loans that the federal government can offer to the states or to businesses. In March, as most states were issuing their stay-at-home orders, Trump vilified the Democratic governors who acted early, such as Jay Inslee in Washington and Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan. He said that they were acting disloyal um, for critiquing his response and also directed his uh, vice president, Mike Pence, to not call back the governors who had not displayed enough loyalty if they said they needed more supplies. States were then forced to compete for what was a scarcity of personal protective equipment in the federal stockpile. And states also had to bid each other for federal loans. And finally, this made the Republican governors much more likely to reopen their states quickly after issuing shelter in place orders with pretty bad effects on the spread of the virus. Um, this is just a calculation from Bloomberg Business Week about where the uh, payroll paycheck protection um, loans went through this SBA. Here we find that on a per capita basis, the big blue states, especially California and New York, were the least likely to receive loans, um, whereas the red states received many more loans per capita. There's also been more of a politicization of the rule of law. Uh, you know, in February, um, well, actually in 2019, Trump was impeached by the House of Representatives on corruption charges related to pressuring Ukraine to investigate Hunter Biden, the son of Joe Biden. Um, and he was ultimately not convicted by the Senate, but he has continued to govern in ways um, that display a degree of sort of paranoia and discomfort with um, how, how, whether or not people are being loyal to him. So he has used the crisis as an opportunity to fire critics and reward loyalists. In April and May, he fired five of the inspectors general, which is an office tasked with oversight responsibilities and the executive agencies. Um, some of these inspectors general were overseeing funds for coronavirus disbursement at the Pentagon or were part of the whistleblowing activity in Ukraine or have been investigating Pompeo's use of State Department funds. So these are people with potential information that could hurt him. Um, he has also put his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, in charge of a supply chain task force that was meant to procure additional PPE supplies for the states, but ended up prioritizing bids from Trump allies. And in, also there are claims and reports that they interfered with FEMA's procurement processes and reports of supply interdiction, meaning that they captured supplies that were already intended to go to specific hospital networks, um, some in New Jersey, some in uh, the Pacific Northwest, for example, and redirect them to other states. Um, Sidelining the CDC, you might have seen the news uh, as of yesterday that the Trump administration asked hospitals to send data on coronavirus cases directly to the Department of Health and Human Services and to circumvent the CDC when the typical procedure is that you would send all that data to the CDC first. He has been reluctant. The CDC former directors have spoken out about the fact that Dr. Redfield, the director of the CDC, has been marginalized in a lot of the coronavirus response. 
And finally, uh, he made news this week for pardoning Roger Stone, who was a convicted felon who lied to Congress in the Russia investigation and was uh, set to begin a prison sentence for being found guilty. Um, this actually prompted Bob Mueller, whose Mueller report was completed last year, um, to write an op-ed in the Post denouncing this as a perversion of the rule of law and as a corrupt act by the president. Now, I just, before we move on to inequality, want to say that a crisis can be an opportunity for leaders to unify rather than divide. And polarization before the pandemic did not necessarily mean that, the polariza that polarization would affect the response to the pandemic, but it does seem to have. Now, moving on to inequality and racial justice or issues of racial injustice, um, which is how we've been discussing it since the pandemic began, a uh, brief lay of the land, the United States is one of the most unequal, if not the most, by some measures, of the advanced industrial democracies. We also have the highest poverty rates after transfers. Um, and income and wealth inequality have been rising for decades, spawning a wealth of literature about inequality and the, the effects of inequality for our politics and for our society. This is just a measure from the World Bank of the Gini Index, which measures the ratio of the top income brackets to the bottom. Um, and inequality has worsened since the 2008 financial crisis, which we have basically recovered from as a country and our economy was doing incredibly well in early 2020, but the gains from the recovery have been very unequally distributed. So wages have been pretty much stagnant for low and middle income earners for the past few decades, um, but wealth has risen for the top fifth and especially top 1% of the countries um, of the income earners in the distribution. There's also a racial element to this in that there's a persistent racial wealth gap, one that we have fortunately uh, been talking about in earnest in the past few months. Um, but the amount of wealth held by white families exceeds that of any other racial group. And this is true even when you control for any number of things. So the black and white wealth gap is a persistent, um, is a persistent one in our country. And even when black and white people both own homes, white families are likely to have more wealth. Even when black and white people make the same income every year, white families are still likely to hold more wealth. So there are any number of factors that drive this um, that cannot be solved through some typical policy interventions of the kind that we have usually used. Now, in an era of COVID, these inequalities have become more stark. This is data from the CDC showing hospitalization rates. Um, we know that during the crisis, uh, Native Americans and Black Americans have been much more likely not only to contract coronavirus, but to be hospitalized from it. Um, and in various times over the past 16 weeks, they've sometimes been two to three times more likely to die from it than white Americans. This is a chart of death rates um, reported to the CDC showing just how big the disparity is between Black Americans and white Americans, and also Hispanic Americans. So how will inequality be affected by the COVID crisis? There have been record unemployment claims filed since the pandemic hit. Um, for the past 16 weeks, per week, there have been at least 1 million unemployment claims hired. Um, and in late June, there were 33 million Americans on some form of assistance who were getting jobless benefits, which is five times the amount at the peak of the Great Recession, 2008-2009. Um, so the recovery is also likely to be very uneven because the COVID crisis um, sort of hastened some of the structural changes to our economy that were already in place, some of the decline of good jobs and instead the rise of jobs that are sort of unprotected, non-unionized, very low wage work. Um, workers in essential services in the pandemic or the gig economy have had few job protections while demands for those jobs uh, have gone way up. And essential workers, unsurprisingly, are therefore the ones who are contracting COVID at much higher rates. And finally, the economy seems to be doing well right now. Um, some of that is because of the CARES Act, the COVID recovery um, relief bill that Congress passed earlier this year that gave extra unemployment benefits and funds to Americans who had lost their jobs. But some of those benefits are set to expire at the end of this month. And also some of the sectoral bailouts, like that of the airline industry, for example, are set to expire in September. So there is going to be some hit to the economy when those benefits expire. Now, prior to the COVID-19 crisis, economic mobility was already on the decline. This is not a super updated chart. This is just showing that 
economic mobility was already sort of declining in the post-war period when we typically think of there being robust economic growth. This is a measure from Raj Chetty's data on inequality. Um, but inequality, if it's hastened by COVID-19, uh, will, will likely be pretty bad for our politics and our society. First, polarization and inequality are somewhat linked. We know that affluent citizens have greater opportunities to influence politics and that political elites tend to uh, subscribe to the preferences of the affluent even when they represent constituencies that have high numbers of poor or low-income voters. Um, we also know that inequality contributes to the sense that communities have been left behind by economic changes like globalization or deunionization, which both of the parties have been on board with. So in other words, we have a politics in which elites in both parties support economic policies that leave many Americans worse off, which is therefore likely to drive more cynicism in the future. And finally, there are devastating health effects even before coronavirus. Deaths of despair, high rates of suicide and opioid addiction in some of these communities. And also the COVID crisis has revealed the stark disparities in health access and care for different populations, uh, which, are, which are likely to, be, to take a long time to resolve. Now to move on to the final thing, uh, we have a presidential election coming up in November. And under normal circumstances, I think we would all be very tired of talking about the presidential election. Usually the summer before November is full of campaign rallies, campaign uh, you know, debates and conventions and ads. And it is quite frankly, sometimes exhausting to be a voter in a presidential election year. Um, things are very different in the era of a pandemic when the candidates are basically not able to campaign and be out on the campaign trail. Um, given that the two are both septuagenarians, I think it would be a, a difficult ask anyway, but still we have to think about what are the typical election troubles we would face and how are they affected by the pandemic. So prior to the coronavirus crisis and prior to this year's presidential election, there were already a lot of elements of our campaigns and elections that Americans seemed irritated by. The first is campaign finance. Elections have become increasingly expensive in the United States. They cost millions of dollars. Um, primary elections themselves have also become huge sources of competition and uh, financing. The financing also is not from all Americans. Usually corporations or organizations and high net worth individuals are far more likely to donate substantial amounts to campaigns than um, average citizens are able to. So that provides another avenue of access for the wealthy that maybe not be available to the rest of the American citizens. Um, another issue in our elections was political gerrymandering. And this is particularly true for state legislatures because after the census, when the states get to redraw their lines, it's elected officials who have partisan interests who often redraw the lines and potentially draw them in ways that benefit their party. This has come up before the Supreme Court on multiple occasions, and it sort of remains to be seen what the sort of future of gerrymandering is, but that is at least something that Americans expressed concerned about. In 2016, uh, there were many concerns with election interference, um, disinformation campaigns from foreign agents like the Russian government. And finally, we have a bizarre, I won't say bizarre, we have a unique electoral system um, that among the advanced democracies, it's called a first past the post or a winner take all system where the person with the most votes wins the entire election. Oftentimes that means that the distribution of seats in Congress um, is not proportional to the popular support for those parties in the public. And the clearest way that this is evidenced is the electoral college, which aggregates votes by state instead of by individual voter. So in 2016, even though Donald Trump lost the election by about 3 million votes, he was nonetheless able to capture the presidency. Most other states allocate their seats proportionally, um, which leads to different types of representative outcomes and responsiveness. Um, but that is just one of the ways that the United States is also singular. Now, the reason I highlight these here is because there's actually been a lot of activity at the state level to try to address all of these things. Americans have been eager to do ranked choice voting, for example, or to try to create more transparency in campaign financing or more independence and nonpartisanship in the drawing of districts. And that has shown up on a lot of state ballots. Now, we also have a unique form of election administration in the United States. Most other countries, um, even democratizing countries have centralized administration of elections by nonpartisan election officials 
we have highly decentralized elections in the United States, over 10,000 separate jurisdictions, um, and also elections are administered by the secretaries of state who are themselves elected with party labels. So there's partisan election administration as well. And finally, we just have some historical um, unique aspects of our elections. We have high costs of voting, meaning we have to register ourselves, uh, find our nearest polling places, figure out the rules that govern when you can register, et cetera, which is different from many other countries, and also a history of voter suppression. So for like about a century, the Jim Crow South prevented Black Americans from participating in elections at all. So the way that that exhibits itself today is that Democrats tend to favor greater access to the ballot, like um, the motor voter law, for example, which get provided voter registration forms to the DMV, or mail-in ballots and absentee ballots. Whereas Republicans have been very active in campaigns to, to pass voter identification laws or efforts to, in their words, reduce fraud, although there's not really any academic evidence that there's fraud in American elections. Now, I think the worst case scenario, which is not likely, um, but that Biden still said in April, is that Donald Trump might not hold an election during a pandemic. That seems unlikely, but the reason for this statement is that primary elections were happening when the COVID crisis led to shelter in place workers. So in March and April, there were many, many states that still needed to hold their primary elections, even though at that point, Biden was clearly the front runner. And Trump was actively intervening, saying that moving to mail-in ballots would be a source of fraud, that he didn't think we should trust the USPS to do it, and that he didn't even like where some of the precincts were being put up and some of the special elections that were happening. Um, so he has shown uh, sort of an unwillingness to try to update election infrastructure in light of the pandemic. Now, what are some of the challenges to having an election in a pandemic? Right now, there are about 130 lawsuits pending over ballot access and voting rights, over whether or not you can change laws related to absentee ballots, for example, or try to uh, ensure that more people have access to the ballot who didn't before, like felons in Florida, whose voting rights were restored by the electorate, then taken back by the governor, and it's been a back and forth ever since. You also need far greater numbers of trained and healthy poll workers if you're going to hold an in-person election. Most poll workers are about 61 or older, leaving them highly vulnerable and unlikely to want to work on election day, but it requires time to train poll workers. So can we find a pipeline for, for finding enough poll workers? Also, you need supplies, you need adequate PPE, um, pens that you can clean quickly. And also my colleague, Nate Persily, who has been doing a project on healthy elections with MIT, um, says that you know even paper and envelopes are going to be an incredibly high demand. The supply chains for these are usually figured out. You know there's not many people who can provide the right kinds of paper that you need for ballots. These contracts are figured out years in advance. So trying to get all of those supplies in order for a mail-in election is going to be challenging. And finally, there is a risk of infection at the precincts. So that will increase demand for vote by mail. The Wisconsin primary, which was held in April led to at least 40 known cases of COVID being contracted at the polling place. But there are challenges to vote by mail as well. Okay, so there are five states that allow all elections by mail. Another 28, like California, that allow no excuse absentee voting in which you're allowed to request a ballot by mail without providing a reason. But the remaining 17 states require an excuse and some of them have very strict rules governing absentee ballots, like you have to demonstrate an illness or an inability to get to the polls. And they also have very little infrastructure for mail-in ballots. Um, vote by mail, unlike um, voting in person, requires a, a lot of infrastructure around it, not just updated voter lists and signatures from the DMV that have all been compiled, but also more robust election administration to ensure election security from one's home, through the process of getting the ballot to the polls and also a long period of time to count the ballots. So we have, you know, an election night culture in the United States where we like to declare winners the night of. And the problem with doing that in a pandemic when you're voting by mail is that um, we may not have a winner for weeks. So that's not only true for the presidency, but also for all of the down ballot races, the Senate and the House that are going to be relying on election results in a pandemic. We all, were, well, probably not all of us, some of you are young, but in 2000, when Bush and Gore did not have a settled um, sort of victor on election night, Bush still within a few weeks declared himself the winner. And once the narrative was in place, it was sort of difficult to dispel. There could be a similar dynamic happening here. If you don't get agreement from media outlets that they're gonna delay announcing a winner, both 
candidates could simply declare themselves the winner and refuse to concede. Now, the basic requirement of democracy is not only that you have free and fair elections, but legitimate outcomes that are not contested by either party. So that is, I think, a worry of, that some people might have about this year's election. Um, I'm going to conclude by talking about some reasons to be optimistic. First, political reform is an agenda item that has been sort of percolating for years. So, you know, amidst all of this polarization and inequality and cynicism towards the parties, many people have redirected their efforts to thinking about some institutional reforms that might go far to alleviate problems of polarization. Um, and it finally reached sort of a national agenda um, urgency in 2018 when the Democrats retook the House. The first bill that they introduced, Nancy Pelosi and John Sarbanes, was the For the People Act. Now, this was a big bill, okay? It was very unlikely to pass. Mitch McConnell said it was DOA on arrival in the Senate. He called it the Democrat Protection Plan. But nonetheless, it included any number of aspects of reform that activists have been working on for years. So anti-gerrymandering efforts, by that I mean uh, like basically nonpartisan districting commissions, um, more campaign finance disclosures, especially around dark money, national voter registration, and also making election day a holiday. So these are things that would make it easier to vote and would also um, increase transparency and try to decrease the politicization of some elements of our election infrastructure. Uh, there have also been more states that adopted ranked choice voting. Maine is going to do all of its elections through ranked choice voting. Uh, California does many of its local elections through ranked choice voting. And Massachusetts is going to vote on ranked choice voting this fall on the ballot. Ranked choice voting is a way of ordering your vote so that instead of picking your favorite candidate, you can pick your one, two, three, four. Not only does this potentially ensure that people can vote their true preference. So instead of having to be strategic and vote for who you think has the most chance of winning, you're likely to, you can actually vote for who you like best. But also there's a theory that it incentivizes candidates to act differently because instead of just mobilizing their base, they have to reach across the aisle to try to guarantee the most votes um, in order to be victorious. Um, and the final thing is that there has been more activity on electoral college reform. Now it's probably unlikely that we ban the Electoral College or get rid of it, but we can try to make the votes of the Electoral College proportional to the votes received in the electorate. Um, there was a faithless electors Supreme Court case that happened a few weeks ago, but at any rate, people seem to be receptive to potentially reforming that. Um, and finally, you know, protests um, and, and civic engagement are critical to democracy. 2019 was a big watershed year of protests. There has been declining um, support for democracy. And by that, I don't mean that people want authoritarianism, but more that people are upset with democracy in their own countries. Democracy indicators have been going down. Over the past few years, my colleague Larry Diamond has written about the sort of democratic recession. But in 2019, there was this groundswell of political and public um, movements against their governments, um, critical of how democratic leaders were consolidating power and critical of the corruption that many people saw in their both authoritarian and democratic regimes. This led to the ousting of some dictators like in Sudan and in Algeria. Um, the Hong Kong democracy protests received worldwide attention, for example. So the United States is now part of a global movement of people who are demanding a changes in their own countries and better, more effective governance. In the United States, the Black Lives Matter protests are some of the largest in our history. They were multi-generational and multi-racial. Um, and that is a cause for optimism because protests and civic engagement are what push democracy forward. There has been no epic of significant political change that was catalyzed purely through elite top-down action. There needs to be vociferous um, and ongoing demand from the public and holding leaders accountable. And that is what creates change that is sustained in the long run. So the final thing I can say is to please vote in November. Hopefully you have an easy way of doing that for everyone to thank you and stay healthy and to get involved in whatever way you can so you don't have to feel hopeless so that you can feel hopeful. Edie, thank you so much. And you have inspired uh, quite a lot of questions and quite a lot of chat going on. So we're gonna jump right into the questions if you're ready. Yes. Um, starting with, 
Michael Porter at Harvard recently yeah. proposed open primaries for all board voters with the top five going to the general election where there'd be rank choice. Uh, also change how Congress physically works, make them sit and eat not by party, but together. Would these fix polarization? His point is these things could be done quickly without needing constitutional amendments. What do you think about that? So Michael Porter, for those, so I appreciate the question. That's a great question. For those of you who don't know, Michael Porter is a professor at HBS who, with a businesswoman named Catherine Gell, has been really into examining American democracy. And I just say this context because I think it's pretty interesting. His expertise is in business competitiveness and what creates a more competitive market environment. And then when he looked at politics, he realized we have a very anti-competitive politics environment where we have just two parties that have basically a stranglehold on power. Um, and this sort of maybe not monopoly, but duopoly is bad for our politics. So the first recommendation to have a top five primary system, I feel a little bit mixed about only because party primaries arose as a way to um, wrest power away from party elites. But I still think parties are meaningful entities in not only American politics, but in all democratic politics. So I do think that for politics to work, you need competition and that in, in the competitive space, you need differentiated parties. So if you have a, a sort of top two system in California, for example, or a top five system as Porter recommends, you end up getting a blurring of party lines potentially because what you're doing is holding a general election prior to a general election. And really, I think there needs to be robust debate within the parties that leads to candidates who are representative of those parties voters who then compete in a general election. Um, but we have had top two primaries in California that seem to have um, depolarized some of our politics, mainly because Democrats have done very well. So we now have very democratic politics in California. And I'm not, not necessarily sure if that's what all states should do. Um, and on the second point of having members of Congress eat together. So one thing that I'm also hopeful about is that there has been a long project that we've been a part of called the Madison Initiative, which I think is now the Democracy Initiative at the Hewlett Foundation. And they have tried hard to um, support organizations that are working on reforming Congress in particular as the locus of sort of deliberative activity in the United States. And there's been a big effort to modernize Congress. And part of that modernization has to do with how members of Congress behave. Don't fly home every weekend, you know, bring your families to DC, take your job seriously, try to create friendships across the aisle. I think that all of those efforts would go really far. And um, there was a candidate who ran for president many years ago, Evan Bayh, whose father, Birch Bayh, was a longtime senator from Indiana. And Evan Bayh basically dropped out of politics because he said, when I was growing up, my dad had barbecues and baseball teams and all sorts of social activities with anyone in politics. You didn't have to be a member of the same party. Um, whereas now it was so fractured and so divisive that that kind of shared culture of politics was no longer present. So I think that Yes, anything you can do to ameliorate the divided culture among members of Congress would be great. And, and thank you, Giles Goodhead, for that question. So Ted Lu says, thank you for your presentation. What happens when a follower of Trump in a polarized environment sees Trump reverse himself? For example, Trump retweeted posts that mocked mask wearing. Now he says people should wear masks. Do his, do his supporters now wear masks or do they still cling to their original belief? Uh, in other words, do Trump supporters simply believe what he says regardless of what they themselves believe? The answer seems to be yes. And so this is something that's confusing about polarization is that when it comes to actual ideology and policy preferences, Americans are not very divided. There tend to be big majorities in support of any number of things like gun control and more robust immigration policy and addressing climate change, a lot of things. But because of the way motivated reasoning has played out in our polarized atmosphere, people also take such big cues from leaders of their party and from elected officials that they do tend to change their minds when elected officials change their minds. On masks in particular, um, it seems like that's where Trump can exercise great leadership. If he just gets on board with masks, I think that will be really great if, if that's what all the scientists are recommending. And I also want to say that the CDC really bungled masks, mask wearing at the beginning of this pandemic. We were told for a long time that you didn't need them. Here in California, where we have pretty robust public health governance, 
we were told very conflicting evidence on when you needed one. And if you're doing outdoor activity, you don't. Well, like no one can do anything that's not outdoor activity basically. So do you need one or not? So masks have been sort of bungled for any number of reasons, but the evidence does seem to show that if you support Trump, then whatever his position is on a policy, his supporters tend to adopt as well. So Richard Reeder asks, or points out that it's interesting that political polarization changed significantly between 1997 and 2003. To what do you attribute that? Is that the Gingrich revolution? Yes, that is an excellent question. Um, so a slide that I often show, but didn't today, is research from an economist at Stanford named Matthew Gensko showing that uh, the words that Republicans and Democrats used really diverged starting in 1994. I actually grew up in Newt Gingrich's congressional district outside Atlanta, and um, he, you know, was revolutionary in any number of ways. First, the Republicans, when they retook the House in 94, that was like after 30 years of Democratic majorities in the House. So with, with that sort of undoing of Democratic power, he also had a new playbook of how politics would be done. He relied heavily on C-SPAN, for example. He often gave speeches to an empty chamber as a way to sort of mobilize the base, even though there was no one there to receive it. Um, but he knew that he could be sort of piped directly into people's homes. He also demanded that young Republican freshmen uh, use only certain types of words when describing policies. And so there was very little, you know, coherence or whatever with, or parallels with how Democrats were describing problems. And yes, much more of a open politicization um, of any number of phenomena. And as, I mean, I'm not a scholar of Congress per se, but we also know that the way Mitch McConnell has governed in the Senate um, is one that has very much uh, tried to prioritize what's in the need, the sort of exigent needs of the party electoral needs of the party rather than um, some of the sort of more traditional ways that parties are accommodated in Congress. So we've had a couple of, of comments and questions about, uh, about, about looking at the other side. So Obama was also a polarizing president, but the press did not portray him as such. What part of the polarization do you think is the responsibility of the press? Or can we credit to the press? So that is a lot of questions in one question. Um, the first is Obama as a politicizing figure. Um, while I think I agree that he was polarizing in the sense that people had responses to him that were highly divided, right? People, some people loved him, some people despised him. He has certainly catalyzed some political forces that were sort of dormant for a while, um, particularly ones that are critical of race, for example, uh, critical of Black Americans in particular. Um, so I am reluctant to say that he was polarizing in the same way, but I agree that he sometimes elicited a polarized response from the electorate. Now the press, um, I think has itself as an economic sector, right, has been changing a lot. We know that media used to look a certain way. There were sort of three networks on television that dominated what the news was there were sort of fewer gatekeepers in our information environment. Today, we know that newspaper and newspapers are also profitable for a really long time, whereas they have been challenged by the rise of the internet and new forms of media, particularly digital forms of media. By that, I mean, I think the business model for journalism has also changed as a response. I um, am not an expert on all of these trends, but we do know that there's a tendency to report things quickly to potentially do a sort of clickbaity type headlines and stories. Um, and the media has acted, um, I guess the response has been different. If you look at newspapers, for example, that the way that they were reporting stories in 2016 up to the eve of the election didn't necessarily focus a lot on Trump. I'm not sure necessarily how seriously they took Trump's candidacy. They did focus very intensely on Hillary Clinton and her liabilities and issues like her email, um, the email hack that happened and uh, a lot of things related to what kind of president she might be since the assumption seemed to be that she would win. Um, but we also know that there are new forms of media, for example, the tech companies, they are not media companies per se. This is something that I'm sure the next president will also have to contend with is how to think about these companies. But information and the way that it's spread on those platforms also very much affect our national discourse and news stories and how we think about our political leaders. We know that there were disinformation campaigns on those platforms. 
We know that there are certain types of stories like negative stories that tend to garner more attention uh, than positive stories. Um, so I guess the ultimate question is, does the press treat Trump fairly or not? I'm not really sure. I think that they're reporting on a president who's very unique in American history. I think that they're probably torn in any number of different directions about what kind of stories ought to be the most salient. But I also think that the media environment is itself just different. Like, I don't even know what it means when we talk about the media, since that encompasses so many different things. Um, so I'm not sure that he's necessarily receiving less fair treatment than Obama did. Okay, thank you. Um... What is, from Nelson, uh, what is the worst case scenario? Can President Trump find a way to postpone elections? If he loses the elections, what happens if he refuses to turn over power? I don't necessarily think the worst case scenario is the most likely, which is that the election is canceled. There are lots of other countries right now that have thought about canceling their elections or taking action to delay their elections. I'm not sure that's likely in the United States only because there's no historical precedent for it. We had elections during the Civil War, during world wars, during huge crises, 1968, for example, when leaders were being assassinated and there were riots in the streets all the time. So do we need to cancel the elect or is it likely that Trump does that? I really doubt it. Um, but the legitimacy of the outcome, I think it will take a concerted effort on the part of both the public and the media to be patient with election results. And ultimately, Trump, um, he does seem to like to use his power, but he doesn't necessarily seem like he'll refuse to let go of it. I mean, there are such uh, aggressive norms of peaceful election turnover um, and sort of informal alliances between the presidents over time, even if they're of different parties, that um, I don't think we should necessarily be so worried that they just don't leave the White House in January if he's if he's not reelected. I mean, he could also be reelected. Absolutely. Uh, from Stu, how does dissatisfaction with both parties change the election fundraising dynamic for the future? Do independent party candidates pose a viable option or threat in future presidential elections? So that's a great question. There is a lot of evidence that campaign financers, so people who do give money to elections, whether it's people giving a dollar um, here and there over PayPal on a candidate's website, or if it's someone giving $16 million, that they tend to be more ideologically extreme than the average voter. So, um, you know, I think that people who are not happy with either of the parties are unlikely to give money, which then can exacerbate problems of polarization. That said, independent parties are not likely to do well given our first past the post system. Uh, because a third party candidate stands a really low chance of winning, which then makes Americans vote strategically and not vote for third parties. And even if you could. Oh, could you repeat that? Edie? You froze for a second. <laughs> yeah, just that they have very low uh, ability. A third party candidate in the Senate or in the House would have very little probability of affecting a policy outcome. And for the presidency, you know, Ross Perot won 19% of the popular vote in 1992, but didn't win any electoral college votes. So the way that we aggregate presidential votes makes it especially unlikely for a third party candidate to do well. And I think earlier this last year when some third parties, you know, some sort of never Trumpers um, were trying to think about ways to mount a potential independent candidate uh, this year, one thing that became really hard is what would an independent party look like? You know, who are you, what factions are you drawing from inside both of the existing parties that could somehow be united in a third party? I think that's also one of the difficulties. If we had a proportional system, we would have multiple parties and probably a party on the left, a party on the right, and then two parties in the middle, like a center right and a center left party. But a third party, I think, in our current electoral environment uh, with our current rules has very little chance of winning. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jamie Batiz uh, asks, um, this is a fascinating question to me. In your opinion, what is the biggest factor or initiative that can help all of us gain our trust back in our democracy? Oh, I, many of us who work on American democracy get this question all the time and there is no good silver bullet answer. I do think that electoral system reform could potentially do that. In other words, I think that a lot of our politics is shaped by our institutions. Um, this is something that we as Americans don't necessarily 
think about a lot because other countries are often very flexible with their institutions. They may adapt them over time. Um, and we tend to really like our institutions as they are. Um, I think that if third party candidates were viable or if um, people felt as if their vote was really going to count, that that might make people feel a little more invested in the system and it might also make parties more responsive. But um, I will plug, so in addition to electoral system reform, I'll just plug a project I'm working on, which is uh, I think stronger parties would also help. I think our parties right now seem like they're sort of captured by special interests and they often seem to work at odds with many with what many citizens want in that if the parties were actually more embedded in society and had more connections to voters and could actually channel what voters want and turn that into policy rather than being responsive to a somewhat more narrow group that that would actually help as well if parties could sort of do their jobs and show us that they are taking governing seriously that would help Thank you so much Didi this has been wonderful and I apologize to everybody that we're not going to have time to get to all of the incredible questions. There are uh, 53 wonderful questions um, on our list, but I know that it is noon and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Do you have any last final thought that you'd like to share? I'm just so sorry for the internet shortage and disruption, but I really thank all of you for the lively discussion, for the great questions and appreciate Alexa inviting me today. So please stay plugged into the alumni community.